Well, welcome, dear friends, for another Bible study here at JMBC. If you have been um, studying with us, you know that we're in this magnificent book of the Revelation. The commentator Matthew Henry says about Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole Bible is, for all revelation comes through Christ and all centers in him. And especially in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son and concerning his son. Christ, as the king of his church, has been pleased to let his church know by what rules and methods he will proceed in his government. And as the prophet of the church, he has made known to us the things that shall be thereafter, unquote. So we are now uh, in chapter two, studying the seven churches. There's an image that you should be seeing on the screen that shows the location of these seven churches. They were real churches in the Roman province of Asia Minor, what is now called Turkey. The letters are profitable for, were profitable for Christians of every era because there is, as Solomon said, nothing new under the sun. Problems of the seven churches, the problems of the seven churches at that time are the same ones that we face today. Already we have studied Ephesus, the loveless, the loveless church, Smyrna, the persecuted church, and we're moving on today to Pergamon. What we see in all of the letters is a pattern. There is, address, there is an address to the messenger of the church. We'll talk about the messenger in a minute. A statement about Jesus, a statement addressing the condition of the church, a pronouncement regarding the condition, either a commendation or a warning, an instruction from Jesus to the church, a general exhortation, and a promise of a reward. And before we begin, let us pray. Father, we look to you now as we gather in this place to study your holy word. We humbly ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will guide and direct this study, change hearts, open eyes and ears to the truth of your word. Here I am, Lord. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The 2024 theme at JMBC is Kingdom Citizens Moving from Earthly Confirmation to Spiritual Transformation. We are not to be conformed to the image of this world, but to be transformed through the renewing of our minds. The October emphasis is being a transforming church in a conforming world, messages to the seven churches. The thought for the month, kingdom citizens must be agents of transformation, reflecting ministry and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They must be an organized body operating in spiritual unity, not conform to the world, but reflecting the kingdom of God in discipline and doctrine. Our key phrases are ministry, worldliness, true believers, and uncompromising. This is lesson 43, Pergamon, the compromising church. Our questions to consider. What are some false teachings that challenge the church today? Uh, in, my, in my opinion, um, the prosperity gospel, the name it and claim it, and in some places, legalism, believing that salvation can be earned. How have you ever been tempted to follow false teachers for a personal gain? And, and I think truth, truthfully, way back in my spiritual life, the prosperity gospel was something that I listened to for a while until I began to study and grow in God's word. What are some ways you have used to challenge or rebuke false teaching? Study God's word, study, study, and study some more. Our text today comes from Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, and we're going to go through that passage as we go through the lesson. Our heart of the lesson, the transforming church must condemn the immorality of a conforming world. Our introduction. The name Pergamon means thoroughly married. Now, this in your studies, you will you can you can possibly see 
uh, three ways that this area is called Pergamon, Pergamon, M-O-N, or Pergamos, M-O-S. They are all the same depending on what language um, is being used, ancient Greek, modern Greek, or Latin. It was the political center of the Roman, of, of Rome. The city was a center for culture and education, having one of the great libraries of the ancient world with over 200,000 volumes. And, and by the way, that was before the printing press, so those volumes were created by hand. It was also the first place where parchment was made. The city was engulfed in paganism and idolatry. It had temples to Greek and Roman gods, Diocinus, Athena, Demeter, and Zeus. It also had temples dedicated to the worship of the emperor. It was especially known as a center for the worship of a deity known as Aseplius. Aseplius was the god of healing and knowledge, represented by a serpent. There was a medical school in, in Pergamon, and because of the, this famous uh, medical school and this temple to the Roman god, people would come there um, to be healed. And the way it worked was they would go into this temple at night. And in the temple, there were non-poisonous snakes. And uh, if the snake crawled over the person while they were lying there over the night, the person considered themselves to be healing. And, and the, the, the city's coins also uh, depicted this intertwined serpent to represent the interconnection between the sacred and the secular. Now, for, for serious Bible students, I want to give you something for your quiet time study this week. Right now, you're, probably, you're seeing two images on the screen. One is an artist's rendition of Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 to 9, and the second one is a picture of the caduceus. Medical professionals will recognize the caduceus as a symbol of their profession. And in Numbers 21, um, I'm, not, I'm not going to read it, but go to Numbers 21, verses 8 to 20, uh, no, Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 to 9, and take a look at what you think about this, this artist rendition and how it compares with this caduceus. In Pergamon, there was little distinction between religion and politics. Kind of sounds like today. For the, pagan in, for the pagans in the city, politics was religion and religion was politics. The, the believers in Christ were constantly tempted to compromise their beliefs and practices for political and ex economic gain. The core problem in Pergamon was that the, the Christians were drifting away from the scriptures. There was a, a mixed marriage of godliness and worldliness among some in the church, and Jesus was calling them to repentance. Our first discussion point says Jesus sees us and knows all and we're in verses 12 to 13. In the seven letters, Jesus always says something like, he always says something like, I see, I know, I understand. It should, it should remind us as a church that God is what we call in our small group, the three omnis. He's omnipresent. He's always there. He's everywhere all at the same time. He's omniscient. He knows all, and he's omnipotent, all-powerful. So let's look at these passages. Starting with Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, Christ announces himself as the bearer of the two-edged sword, the God of power to the angel of the church in Pergamon, write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword to the angel of the church, in Pergamon. Angel in that passage uh, comes from the Greek word angelos, and it's a messenger of God. Now we think 
of angels as celestial beings, but it, it also refers to the pastor of the church. And in these letters, I think it's safe for us to believe that the angel that is being referred to here is the pastors of these seven churches. They, and they, by the way, are represented in Revelation 1, 6, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, by the seven stars. The, the next passage, to the church in, in Pergamon. Now, not, not much is known about how or when this church was established there. All that is known is what is said here in the book of Revelation. In each of the seven letters, Jesus describes himself, and the description is based on the need or the condemnation of that church. So here at Pergamon, Jesus describes himself, Jesus with the two-edged sword. This is not a comforting salutation. It's an immediate warning. Jesus with the sword is coming in judgment. The church at Pergamon was infested with people of corrupt minds who did what they could to corrupt both the faith and the behavior of the church. What this is telling us, Christ will fight against them by the sword of his word. Hence the, the title of him that has the sharp sword and the two edges. The word of God is a sword, is a weapon, both offensive and defensive. It is a sharp sword. No heart is so hard that it cannot it, uh, divide or instruct it. It is a sword with two edges. It turns and cuts every way. Jesus will judge the church at Pergamon and all churches, this is telling us, on the basis of his word, which is true. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, continuing now in verse 13, he assured the believers that he knew they dwelt in a city where Satan that was under Satan's control. It says, I know where you live where Satan has his throne, and thou holdest fast my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the day in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, some translations say witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Let's break this down. First thing to notice is, is what, how Jesus addresses this. You hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. And even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one. I think by using the, that possessive term, Jesus is uh, taking his claim on the church. Let us never forget that the church belongs to him. And where thou dwellest, Jesus was saying, I know what the situation and circumstances are where you are. He's, he's everywhere all the time. Even where Satan's seat is in the middle of idolatry, superstition, persecution of, the, of Christians, he's saying, I know what's going on. Where, where Satan has his throne, meaning a center of satanic activity in the city, a dark and demonic place. And you hold fast to my name. What does it mean to hold fast to his name? not ashamed of our relationship with him, to hold fast to his name, Christian, followers of Christ, is an honor and an, a privilege to carry his name. Like the wife bears the name of her husband, we hold fast to his name. You did not renounce your faith in me. What made him, them and us faithful is the doctrine of grace. In other words, 
He was saying that they had not denied the gospel. He praised them for holding fast to him, even in the face of danger, persecution, and even death. Antipas is one of the great yet anonymous heroes in the Bible. History really tells us nothing about him except what we see here. He was a martyr. And by the way, martyr comes from the Greek word, which also means witness. His, his name means against all. He was a faithful disciple of Christ. And for his faithful witness, he suffered and died. The rest of the believers there knew this, saw it, yet they were not discouraged nor drawn away from their faith. That's what Jesus is saying. It also tells us that in the spite of all of what's going on around us, it's still, impo it's still possible to live a Christian life. And what do we say about today? The, 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 the text writer says, witchcraft, which includes Wicca, paganism, folk magic, and other New Age traditions are among the fastest growing spiritual paths in America. Many believe in the occult, magic, horoscopes, crystal balls, and lucky charms. Worldly holidays like Halloween are accepted by many churches. How about church-sponsored Easter egg hunts? And also, let's remember Christmas when we celebrate the birth of Christ for many more. Uh, Christmas is more about Christmas trees and decorations than it is about, and, and shopping, by the way, than it is about him. And we'll ask some questions, which uh, I hope that you will study in your small groups. The, the question number one, do you agree? Another way to, to, to ask that is, are you willing to compromise that these practices are not of God and should not be condoned, certainly not incorporated into worship? The next question is, should kingdom citizens adopt an attitude that it's okay, it's for the children, and no harm is being done? Are you willing to compromise? Discussion point number two. Perversion of the gospel is unacceptable. Verses 14 to 15. After praising them for what some are doing right, for Jesus rebukes them for some practices that are totally unacceptable, namely perverting the gospel. In verse 14, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Some among you, why did Jesus bring up some? It, it is, if it's just some in the church, is that a big deal? Yes, it is. Some in the church have the potential to corrupt um, doctrine, propagated. It. It's being propagated by false prophets, and it leads to corrupt worship and even corrupt conversations. To continue in communion with persons in the church in corrupt principles and practices, Jesus is saying, is displeasing. It puts a guilt and a blemish upon the whole body because they are partakers of other men's sins. We are warned against this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 7, and also in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. Now, though the church has no power to punish people per se, it does have the power to exclude them from communion. And if it did not do so, Christ, the head and lawgiver of the church, will not be pleased with it. It continues, those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. So some followers of the doctrine of Balaam had infiltrated the church at Pergamon. 
Some who taught that it was lawful to eat things sacrificed to idols and that simple fornication was no sin. By an impure worship, it drew men into impure practices as Balaam did with the Israelites. Now, you will remember back in the story of Balaam back in Numbers chapter 22 through 24. Um, Balaam was this false prophet who was hired by the king of the Moabites, Balak, to curse the people of Israel. And I'm not going to go through the whole story, but you, sh you should go back and um, reverse it, I mean, and review it for your own um, edification. The doctrine of Balaam is an attitude that one can fully cooperate with the world and still serve God. The doctrine of Balaam is a belief that a little sin doesn't hurt. Galatians 5.9 says the opposite. A, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Or the other, other translation says a little yeast works through the whole bunch of the dough. Yeast in scripture is always a picture of sin. And the reason it is a beautiful picture is that it actually uh, uh, pictures what happens with sin. It permeates. It permeates. And that's what sin does. Even just a little will permeate the whole body of Christ. Verse 15 says, likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, who the Nicolaitans are is unclear in the Bible. Now, you, you can find various historical references to who they are. But what we know in scripture about them is what we see written right here. And what we know is that back in um, Revelation in, in Revelation 2, verse 6, Jesus says, um, the Ephesians opposed them and Jesus hated them. That's enough for us to know. That's enough for us to know. So, so Satan loves religion and has many people practicing false ones all around the world. Many of them even mention the name of Jesus. We should understand that Satan uses every vice and attempt to destroy the kingdom. He began way back by trying to tempt Jesus. Remember when Jesus came out of the wilderness? He tried persecuting the church, killing the disciples. What's happening, what we're being shown right now is Satan is trying to um, diminish the church by inter the introduction of false doctrine. So we need to be very mindful. Um, it's like a, a boat. You, you'll see a boat sailing along and it's fine as long as it's above water, but if it begins to take on water, it will eventually sink. That's what we're being shown here, that a little bit of sin that permeates through the body of Christ has the potential of destroying the kingdom. Discussion point number three. God is always willing to accept repentance, verses 16 through 17. Repent, therefore. Repent means turn away, turn back. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Repentance is the duty of saints as well as, as of sinners. So Jesus is exhorting the believers here to re repent. And by the way, where he says, Un unless you do that, I will come and fight against you. I will never want to be the one to, to uh, have war with Jesus. To the one who is victorious, I will give some hidden manna. We remember manna as the supernatural food God sent from heaven to sustain the Israelites in the wilderness. Hidden manna is Jesus, God's perfect provision. The true bread from heaven, it tells us that in John chapter 6. J Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now, he gives, he gives us eternal life. The body will die, but the spirit lives eternally. Jesus is saying the prize for overcoming 
is me. And he gives them in verse 17 the promise of a blessing. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now, in the ancient world, the use of a white stone had many associations. A white stone could be a ticket to a banquet. It could be a sign of friendship. It could be um, evidence of having been counted or a sign of acquittal in a court of law. Whatever it means, Jesus may have had many meanings in mind, but all of these, at the very least, are the assurance of a blessing. And finally, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. This qualifies everyone, or at least whoever will listen, and that includes us. This letter was not only written to the church, then it is written to us and to all Christians throughout the centuries. So as we close now, uh, I'm, going, I'm going back to uh, ch chapter one of the Revelation and I'm going to read. Grace and peace to you from him, from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen.